the R video tutorial on smoothing forecasting methods part one. So this will be broken up into two parts, one that doesn't deal with seasonality, which is this one, and one that does see, deal with seasonality, which will be the next one. All right, let's get started. So what we're going to do is we're going to read in some data. I have a color temperature data set that is a time series that uh, is pulled off of a satellite and it's reading the color temperature that the satellite is reading. And here is the code to read this in. If you're not familiar with how to read in data, please go read the, or watch the video on that. All right, so I've read in my data. You notice over here, here are my values, and you can see the values uh, are data that comes in, out to three decimal places, and the column header is X. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot this so we can get a picture of it using the plot.ts function, and we just put in color one, dollar sign X, and this will provide us with the data that we need to make our picture. Okay, so here's our picture. Notice that the data goes up and it comes down and it goes up and it comes down and then it goes down and then it comes back up. So this would probably be a non-stationary time series, but as we're dealing with uh, exponentially weighted uh, moving average smoothing method, we don't really worry about stationarity like you would worry about in ARIMA. This is uh, a basically, I would consider it an ad hoc method that works really well, but uh, you can get a good look at the data here. All right, so let's go back and fit a model. Now, I'm gonna fit the model several times here so that you can get an idea of how to deal with uh, R in conducting exponentially weighted moving averages. So here, I'm gonna use the whole winters function. It, the reason I'm using this is, number one, it's canned in R, I don't need to load any additional packages, and it will do everything I need it to do. So you're gonna to need to know what exponentially weighted moving averages are, double exponential smoothing for this video, uh, and you should learn those in a course or a textbook somewhere. I'm not gonna teach what they are here, but I'm gonna show you how to do this. So you know that there are parameters in the Holt Winters model, uh, alpha is the parameter alpha in the exponentially weighted uh, moving average model. There's a parameter beta, which is controls the how the trend adapts, and gamma controls how the adaptation of the seasonal values, but we're not going to worry about it right now. If you specify a value, like here, alpha equals 0.2, I'm specifying that I want alpha in my exponentially weighted moving average to be 0.2. I'm going to come back and fit it where I comment this out, and R will actually estimate it for me, which is kind of fun. I don't need to choose it. So, uh, so use the Holt winners, put in your data, specify alpha, beta, and gamma if you know them, uh, or you have pre-specified values that you prefer. Otherwise, R will estimate it, and we're going to try it first by pre-specifying. So I run this, and I can come over here. I'm just going to look at what the output looks like. So the output gives me the call, the code that I put in, and notice it says smoothing parameters, alpha equals 0.2, and that's what I specified it to be. And the coefficients, A, uh, gives me the value of the level at the end. So here, doesn't have any seasonal component, doesn't have any trend component. Usually what people wanna do with this, in this case, would just be to get some either fitted values off, and I'll show you how to do that here in a second, but really they wanna predict with it. So we can use the predict function, which is just a generic function that you can put all kinds of things in. It works well with the Holt Winters function. Uh, I'm going to put in the model that I fit here. So this is color1.mean, and the reason I have it as mean is because I'm only modeling the mean, and I'm gonna predict ahead, and ahead equals 10. So this is how many time periods in the future I'm going to have. And it will also give me a prediction interval. Some people like prediction intervals, some people don't. I'm a statistician, I love prediction intervals. They tell me the uncertainty associated with this. So I'm gonna run this. And now I'm gonna look and see what it looks like. Here, real quick. And notice that it gives me a time series out and it tells when it starts, when it ends, it tells me the frequency. It tells me the fitted value for my forecast, so this is my forecasted value. This gives me the upper bound and the lower bound on my confidence 
intervals or prediction intervals. So what I'm going to do is you're just going to plot it. It's easy to look at when you plot it. So here I'm going to use plot.ts. I'm going to rescale my picture so that I'm looking more at the end. So it's a zoom in. So I'm going to specify the x limits to go between 200 and 370. The reason I picked 200 is by looking at the picture, it, it's a reasonable zoom in. How I came up with 370 is I noticed that my predictions end at 369. So I want to make sure I have space for it, so I'm making it go to 370. So if I do this, I'm going to go through this line by line, this will create the base plot. Then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to want to put fitted values on here. And if I look at just these by themselves, I'm going to run just this little bit of code. You see it gives me all the fitted values here. And since I'm only estimating a mean, uh, I get here x hat, which is the prediction, and then the level. And here they pretty much are the same thing all the way down because I don't have a trend. When I have a trend, a column will come up with trend as well. So here I'm going to grab the first column, which is my prediction. So this is what this code does, and I'm going to color it green. Then I'm going to use the predictions. The predictions, if you remember, the first column was the, well, we can scroll over here. The first column is the fitted values. The second column is the upper bound. The third column is the lower bound. So I'm going to use three line statements where the first column is in blue, that's my predictions, and my upper bound and my lower bound are going to be in red. So let's see what this picture looks like. So here, you notice I've zoomed in. You can see my fitted value. When I chose 0.2, this is the fitted value. It's smoothing along. Notice that this is an exponentially weighted moving average, and it's a trailing moving average, so it's always behind. It's, it's not right on top of the data, but it's following the data. And if I chose point two, my prediction would be this blue line here, and these are my prediction bounds. Now, looking at this, I would say this probably is ridiculous, only for the fact that my last value is higher than my upper prediction bound. So I would say this is nonsensical, but this is a way you can specify this. Now what we want to do is we want to go back and we want to maybe add a trend. So this is what we're going to do is we're going to go back and we're going to change our code. So in most of my videos, I don't actually change the code as I go along. But here I'm going to change the code so that I can put in a trend component and I'm going to specify the value for it. So I'm going to come back over here. And here is beta. I want to add a trend component. So what I will do is I'm going to put in 0.1. This is my smoothing for my trend component, and we're going to see what this effect has on the picture. So I'm going to run this again, and as before, it writes it into color1.mean. It's really not wise to write over your previous analysis, but for this video, I don't want to have a really long set of code. And we can look at the fitted values again. So if I come down here, remember this was my fitted values. So I'm going to grab fitted, and if I scroll through it, I, you'll see that there's an additional column here. There's x hat, which is my prediction, then there's the level. This is my trend, this is my estimated trend from the data, and if you look down through here, yeah, I start at 4, but then in the middle I go negative, as far down as negative 3, and negative 2, and then by the end, the trend is positive again. So we want to see what effect this has on it. So what we're going to do is we're going to predict again, and we are going to plot the picture again, just like we did before, and see what the picture looks like now. Okay, so here's my picture now that I've added a trend, and look, it forecasts the trend forward in time. So whatever the trend that it's ended with is the forecast that it's giving for the future, and this provides a, for, uh, a forecast that is trended upwards. Is that a reasonable thing to do? I don't know. That's totally up to your data and what you perceive. Uh, but this is a way to add a trend into the forecast. And also notice that it seems to follow the data a little bit better. When it makes a turn, it still drags behind, but then it gets to the idea, wait, I'm going downhill, and then it starts fitting the data fairly well, and then when it turns, it's a little bit behind, and it starts going uphill, it's, it'll eventually realize the trend is positive and start fitting it better. So this would be considered the double exponential smoothing model. Okay, so let's go back through this one more time. 
But this time, I am going to comment out alpha and beta. I'm going to use the comment symbol. Now, what will happen is R will estimate these for me. I'm still leaving gamma equals false because I don't want a seasonal component. So let's do this again. And we're going to look at the actual output again. And here, you can see what it shows. It shows alpha to be 1. It shows beta to be 0 0.4403858. So it estimated these for me. Okay. The end level is 1316. The end trend is 7.34. So this estimated alpha and beta for me by simply commenting these out. Now, I know some economists who would freak out if you said alpha is equal to 1. They would be, ah, you can't do that. Uh, it, they like smaller values, but I'm just showing you the power of R that it will do this for you if you don't know what values to pick. So again, I'm going to run predictions, and I'm going to create my picture. If I look at my picture here, you'll notice that this fits the data really well. Even though it does lag behind at the turns, it seems to really follow the data. And look at what it does to the trend. This trend, it says, wow, we're going to shoot up this way. But my upper prediction interval and my lower prediction interval, uh, I find are, are a bit amusing here in the sense that the lower one predicts, you know, it has this arch in it and it's going to go down. It's like, well, I don't think it's going to keep going up. Uh, as the lower one and the upper one's like, wow, I could go crazy upward. Okay. Is this reasonable? I don't know. Uh, it depends on the situation and your data. Would I trust forecasting with this? I probably would be nervous about it, but I'd use the prediction bounds if I thought that this was a reasonable approach. All right, so this has been the R video tutorial, part one of smoothing forecasting methods. If you have any questions, please ask or watch the next video, which has how to deal with the seasonal components.